I'm Paul Higgins, an ex-corporate executive turned business owner who for five years struggled to grow a cloud consulting business whilst battling a chronic disease. With the help of mentors and experts, I got the business model right, built a sales and marketing engine and developed a high performing team that ended in a successful exit. I received a kidney transplant from a mate and now on my second life, I dedicate my time to helping other cloud consultants scale quickly with less effort to enjoy life. Detecting an accent, I'm an Aussie working globally from Melbourne, Australia. I interview successful cloud consultants sharing their scaling stories to give you inspiration and practical tips. I have dedicated experts for cloud consultants on the show to save you time and money by working with the right people. If you want to scale quickly with less effort to enjoy life, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Paul Higgins and welcome to the Cloud Consultant Show, episode number 483. Today's topic is expanding your Salesforce practice with Pardot and you will learn how Salesforce and Pardot can work seamlessly together. So there's some great examples given on how you can do that and it's just incredible how little of the Salesforce users actually use a powerful tool like Pardot, how and who it really fits beautifully for. So there's some great examples of that. And then also some excellent examples of how you can use content to grow your cloud consulting business as our guest today has done for theirs. If you're a first time listener, welcome. If you love what you hear, please subscribe. It's for cloud consultants, people that consult and deploy a SaaS platform. And so if that's you, you're in the right place. If you're a regular Thanks for constantly listening or watching the show. Why don't you give me a bit of a shout out? Uh, Email me at paul at paulhigginsmentoring.com. Tell me that you are a listener or a watcher and also tell me what topics you'd love to get covered. There'll be a summary in the app that you're listening to and you can get the full transcript and more notes at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. It's episode 483. And also I'd like to thank our sponsors. The first is the Cloud Consultants Collective. It's the world's only revenue-focused collective for cloud consultants. It's peers answering questions for peers. And uh, forget Google, forget YouTube. Come and get quick answers on Slack for free. Just go to the cloudconsultantscollective.com to join for free today. And the other is Workflow Academy. Are your top performers feeling overwhelmed by their workload? Do you worry that their performance is suffering or even worse, they might leave? Well, we've got an innovative solution for you. We've partnered with Workflow Academy to provide highly trained junior talent to support your top talent within your business. You can find out more at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash WFA and let us help you achieve your business goals faster. And our guest today is a lifelong learner for sales and marketing automation, had an agency for outsourced sales and marketing, really enjoyed Pardot and how that could complement. So it was about half the cost of what a person was. So they went down a rabbit hole on that. And now they're a world's expert on a Pardot. And they also help Salesforce partners to help their end clients to bring sales and marketing together more because we all need more qualified leads in our business. And this is a great way of doing it. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Cal Springer from GabrielSales.com. Great to have you here, Carol. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, look, really excited to to dive into your story today, which is an exciting one. I know you've had quite a a, a change of of late, but why don't we start with who your ideal clients are and what problems you love to solve for them? Sure. Okay. So I am a Salesforce certified consultant with a focus on Pardot. So Pardot is now called Account Engagement, which is the marketing automation tool that Salesforce owns and uh, sells their clients for marketing automation. And my ideal client is someone that has Pardot and has not really maximized it yet. Because that's a big thing. People buy these tools, they think, oh, it's probably just like MailChimp or something. It's not. It's like MailChimp on steroids, um, 100%. So there's a lot to know. And you know, a real ideal client is someone that has worked with someone else before and they couldn't really cut it for them. And so I think probably the one thing that really makes our company and my expertise really unique is that I understand both Pardot and Salesforce. So I understand marketing and sales and like Salesforce administration. And a lot of 
often product consultants don't really understand the whole Salesforce side of things. And Salesforce admins often don't understand marketing whatsoever. So it becomes a big challenge. So, so someone that can really appreciate that I understand both sides <laughs> is definitely the ideal client. Yeah, and then, um, and and you know when another partner's been in and they haven't been successful with Pardot and getting the result they want, what what are the common themes? Like, what what do you see most? Um, usually, not understanding how the two databases interact with each other. Like, how come my leads aren't going into Salesforce? It's a very common one, and because you didn't assign them to anyone. Where? How do I do reporting? How do I find out which? ads or forms are creating the the most opportunities which ones are getting my return on investment you ask a typical salesforce admin about return on investment it's going to be pretty challenging so yeah that um what else yeah i think it's mainly mainly about how the data flows and just like what are all the sections within the system like what is the page action what's a customer redirect like do i need this why is it even in there and then a lot of times Pardot just rolls out new features all the time and knowing if it's, you know, is it turned on? Can I use it? Do I have permission to it? Probably that's the biggest thing is like just not understanding the tool. A lot of people will buy Pardot and they use it just as an emailing tool, but it's so much more robust than that. Yeah. And then, and, and what is that so much more? Like what is Well, it can track about? all the visits of the cookied prospects on your website. And I'm surprised how many clients did we know that that was a feature. And so if someone fills out a form and then hits seven pages on your website, Pardot can read all those seven pages. And then you can score each page, for example. And then you can run rules if someone hits 120 points because they hit these two key pages. Now add them to a Salesforce campaign or notify the sales representative, create a task in Salesforce. It can do a lot. The big thing that I help people with is a lot of people, when they're sending out emails, they will just import a list. And sometimes they'll pull a list out of Salesforce and import it into Pardot. But these two systems, they talk to each other. And so we were like, how can we make just make this a dynamic list so you never have to import and export again? Or just export and then import. And so teaching people that and what fields can... Pardot read inside of Salesforce. It can't read everything. It can't read custom objects, generally speaking. And so I just tell them, this is where you need the data to show up. And once you get that data to show up in the details section of your lead or account or contact, then Pardot can look at that and then create these lists real time for you. And I'd say that is probably one of the greatest features of the system. It can save you a ton of time. And this question you might not be able to, to answer, but how many people that are using Salesforce are actually using Pardot? Just a fraction. <laughs> so yeah. I, if I had a guess, I would say 5%, you know, so the Salesforce universe is so huge. And I started out as a Pardot expert because in our outsourced sales business, we added that as an additional feature because we used to do a lot of cold calling and we said, oh, we need to use marketing automation. And so we became marketing automation experts and then just really in probably about the last three years, you know, one thing I realized is, oh my gosh, how much could my business open up if we offer Salesforce services, right? Yes. So many more companies use Salesforce than Pardot. But with that, so much more competition, right? <laughs> Not a lot of Salesforce admins know Pardot, but a lot of Salesforce admins know Salesforce, right? And so now, even though my audience is bigger. My competition is much greater as well. But I yeah. still think it's a good thing. And I want, you know, definitely more and more Salesforce yeah, and, only projects. And, you know, and one of the reasons I brought you on is I'm assuming there's an opportunity for Salesforce partners and Salesforce freelancers that have got a client that have the needs that Pardot can solve, but they don't want to be a Pardot expert, right? They don't want to go outside of the, the core that they do. So I'm assuming there's some complementary benefits of working with other Salesforce partners to get the end client result is have you seen that play out at, yes at well i do work with one salesforce partner and they are more of a you know a subcontract and so when i go for the really hard stuff we want to do some flows and some api integrations i bring them in because that's i don't have a lot of that on staff but i'm you know continue to build up my network and also i do have a lot of um in our teams 
We have sales operations expertise. Goes very well with Pardot because Pardot is marketing automation, inbound leads, outbound nurturing. But then what do you do with those leads? You toss them over to Salesforce and then, you know, there's this battle between marketing and sales all the time. The leads suck. You're not following up with my leads, you know. (laughs) There's a little bit of both typically. So try to make both teams accountable. And how do you actually set that up? How does marketing know if sales actually followed up with that? We can set that up with reports and say, okay, here's all the leads you brought in. Here's how many were converted. Here's how long it took to convert. You know, what stage they were at. Here's the reason why I didn't move forward. And so both teams are learning all the time from each other. Right. And and for someone, you know, is there any particular minimum, um, whether it's, you know, turnover, employee count, is there anything that you look at from a, you know, is this company the right fit for Pardot? Like, you know, what sort of indicators are you looking at? Uh, well, yeah, it's really small companies probably can't afford it. But I've actually, I've had clients under a million dollars purchase it because it can actually replace. So we did an experiment once when we were doing cold calling. So we had two full-time cold callers doing lead generation. And but then we also had Pardot going and we saw Pardot generated about two leads a day and the cold caller generated about two leads a day. <laughs> so running Pardot, maintaining it was about half the price of a cold caller. So I say Pardot is a half time, you know, sales resource. So there is one way that you're automating your sales process because you already have the list and it's this series of emails that goes out to educate and it's the beauty of it, it's consistent, right? So here's what we do. Oh, and here's the use case of our product. Oh, and here's the industries that we work in. The same thing a salesperson would have conversations about. Now you can automate that. And I'm sure everyone listening to this gets a plethora of emails (laughs) that are cutesy and these, oh, hi, did you get my last email? We like to stay away from those that are trying to like just pressure people into appointments, but instead make them more Oh, here's the education, you know, and then people will unsubscribe. And if it's just not their need, then it's not their, it's not a fit, it's not a fit. But people that don't unsubscribe, you know, you just keep giving them a little bit more information and, you know, they'll eventually make a decision and possibly move forward and, and then, you know, have a call to action to like book a meeting. And that's, you know, so if we can do that all automated. That's huge. Yeah, and 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 we'll we'll sort of get to the love hate relationship with automation in a moment. But if you look at sort of industries, is there any particular theme of industries where you've seen part of work really well? I've seen definitely tech industries, healthcare, like healthcare related. Like health, I have a couple healthcare software companies, so they're in the, their software serves doctors, and so. And then I have a medical device company as well. So I actually had to go through my little HIPAA training there, which is our patient health information protection here in the States. So I've seen that. I've I've seen realtors use it. I've seen manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing companies. So it's pretty widespread, but I would say people that, you know, it's business to business for sure. And then have a a pretty decent ticket size. And as far as you, I know you use it yourself to grow your own agency, right? So mm-hmm. how are you using a combination of, for you to grow the business and have different lead sources, right? One of them is this automation piece, right? So I know I work with a lot of Salesforce partners and you may be one of them that I'm working with at the moment, uh, listening to Carol and I today. Like, how do we sort of use that? Because it's funny, it's like the plumber with a leaky tap, right? Where there's a lot of Salesforce partners that just mm-hmm. rely on Salesforce themselves to bring them leads. And, mm-hmm. you know, at the moment we're recording this and it's going to be released in July of, of 2023, Salesforce is going through some massive changes. There's been a lot of AEs that have been let go or are looking to go and therefore the consistent leads that you've got as a Salesforce partner may not be there at the moment. Right. It's not everyone, right. but I know some, some have been really impacted. So people are saying, Hey, I need to self generate. And a great option to self generate is to do, you know, outreach the way that you've been doing with Pardo. So take us a little bit through. Right. So this of, is of the very, that. very tricky part yeah. because outreach should be the people you have a relationship with. 
it is a no-no to start cold emailing out of Parda. Parda is for opted in leads. So that is, and I've had people like, well, how do you get them to opt in if you can't email them? I'm like, well, got to do advertisement. You've got to go to trade shows. But for smaller organizations, cloud consultants, networking is huge. And that's why it's it's not an overnight success by any means. So I've been active in LinkedIn for 20 years. I've been on Twitter. I just had my 13-year Twitter anniversary. Can't say I get leads from Twitter. I think I've gotten, like I've gotten a candidate from Twitter. And then I went to Upwork, which is a software website that you go. It's like freelancer.com. Many people, it's pretty big now. Many people have heard of it, but it's where you go to find freelance work. So I do a lot of Upwork jobs and it's it's a lead gen tool and at this point i have such a great reputation there i've got five star ratings that people just come to me and i get to choose who i want to work with but it's it's pretty awesome it's kind of hard to get started but i am a salesperson at core so that is really helpful if you're trying to grow your salesforce agency and you don't like sales (laughs) you need to find someone that does or you need to partner or be a subcontractor under someone like like I mentioned, I work with another Salesforce agency. Their group's not really interested in sales. They're really good at what they do. So they just get a lot of referrals. Yes. And he, you know, the main gentleman there loves working with us because we bring him just new stuff that, you know, some people have pigeonholed into just API, but we do these interesting flows and in introducing sales operations and campaigns where we still need his help. And so he really appreciates that. So just to summarize, the key thing is someone's got to be obviously opt-in and different countries have different standards. So just make yes. sure that they're, they're the, they're the case. Europe, yeah. And, you know, once they're opt-in, then you can use the, the automation on a nurture sequence, which we're all sort of fairly familiar with. But as you said, to get people on the list in the first place, you know, you use LinkedIn and you use Upwork as sort of two key ways. Uh, LinkedIn, right? So, you know, this will be posted on LinkedIn. You probably may have even picked up this interview with uh, Carolyn through the LinkedIn posts that we're doing. You know, tell us, you know, what's working for you on a LinkedIn perspective? You've been doing it for, what'd you say, 20 years? So you've had right. lots of practice. You know, what what's working for you right at this point in uh, gaining new clients through LinkedIn or gaining people right. onto your list, which... Now, often people say, I've got all these connections on LinkedIn, but, you know, then if I look at my email list, there's no one. There's crickets, right? (laughs) How do we sort of convert the two? Yes. So there's a few ways. So one, I look at the jobs. So I'm going to share my trade secrets here. I learned this from working at a staffing company. It was, we used to do accounting staffing back many years ago. And how we found hot leads we found people that were looking for accountants and we would call and said, Hey, do you want to hire a temp while you're hiring someone? We don't use temps. We don't use temps. Eventually they'll call you back. If you talk to them every month, they're like, Hey, you know, we actually need some help right now. Do you have someone that knows Peachtree or whatever the accounting system is? And so I took that method and I go into LinkedIn and I see who is hiring for Pardot jobs that have Pardot in there. And then I connect with those people and then I'll send them messages, direct messages through LinkedIn. And then if they connect with me, then I'll add some of those people to my list if they, you know, are engaging in a conversation. So I start the relationship on LinkedIn, yes. but then continue it. So they're on my in my database now. And some people that don't want to engage, I still reach out to them on LinkedIn from time to time, maybe once a year through a DM and email. And now I'm promoting my YouTube channel. So that's one thing that I've built. And so I'm providing value to the audience. So that is huge. And that's what you need to do on LinkedIn. I'm sure you understand that and probably share that. It's not just about connecting and just waiting for someone to say, oh, I have a job and you the first one to jump on it. You have no relationship with this person. So just providing value. And I and I post I probably post just about once a month, not tons, but it's usually a video. Well, here's a video. I found a lot of people are having this problem with importing or whatever. So here's a video I made. And if this you resonate with this, go ahead and watch it and then try to get them to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I think right. I've gotten the whole time like two leads, you know, in 10 years from actually YouTube, very low 
conversion yes. rate. And of the leads that I've gotten from LinkedIn, it's primary people that I've had some conversation with in the past. So I don't have, I, I actually did get three deals last year from LinkedIn that were cold outreaches through the direct messaging. But they weren't the best deals, you know, yes. they were okay, yeah. but maybe they'll, you know, need a full-time person or a bigger job in the future. So this business, people come and go, oh, we're good, Carol. Because usually what happens, they hire our team to help them learn the system because they thought it would be easy, but it's not so easy to learn. It's not intuitive. But once you once you figure it out, it's like, okay, I like you, you, basically when you're learning new technology, you have to basically train yourself to see how it thinks. Yes. Do I have to do this first or this first? And once you get it, one thing that we do all the time is create playbooks and standard operating procedures for our clients. And I do some of that for my own outreach and LinkedIn posting. We always want to make sure we cover this topic, then this topic, and then this topic. And then we just rotate those six topics, yes. you know, once a month. And so, and then it should be a video and then it should be just a normal blog post. I haven't really done too much of like creating my own social posts in where you do, you can create blogs inside of LinkedIn. I've done that a few times, but yeah, news not a big strategy. Yeah, look, and and you know we we've just started doing that again, and they've changed the algorithm the <laughs> newsletter, and I, and I recommend you have a look at it again, you and you listening or yep. watching, because um, you know, like for example, we're getting, I've, I think I've got four, just under five thousand subscribers to the newsletter, and I'm getting around thirteen hundred uh, impressions a week. And I'm actually getting people to open the, the newsletter about 300. Now, when I say that, we've done it for two weeks. So already. And this is on all on LinkedIn, the newsletter. This is all on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So, yeah. So what I'm doing is taking my, my newsletter huh. that I would give to my subscriber list. I'm taking that and then I'm repurposing that on LinkedIn. And that is getting a really good traction. And the benefit of it is that all of your subscribers get notifications that your newsletter is going out. So it's another great way of getting a, a touch point through LinkedIn. So uh, I definitely look at, at the newsletters. Oh, um, thank you. I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. That and, and a bit of a, a shout out to John Nemo, who's a past guest of the podcast. He did a, a podcast interview on it and it was, yeah. Uh, we, okay, I will listen and, to that one for yeah, sure. I'm, I'm two weeks in and uh, it's working great guns. So just on the messaging, I know that, you know, for us, we split test no message versus message to see what works best just for ourselves and also for the clients I work for. What, what do you find? Do you always personalize a message when you send a connection request or sometimes you just send a connection request without it? I typically... Do not send a message with the message request. And I tend to decline those that I don't think are a fit. Yeah. So. And, and look, I think that's where your profile does all the heavy lifting for you, right? So, you know, sometimes if you're sweating on like, have I got the right message or not? You know, we've found that, you know, you're nearly getting the same um, oh, acceptance. Okay. So, okay. so it might be up to 40% acceptance is sort of the, the gold standard. We get slightly under that. But just by sending a no message connection request because they will go and look at your profile, right? Yes. And then the profile does all the heavy lifting. And um, right. I think if you look at Carol's profile, it's a great example. She's been there for 20 years. She's constantly perfected it. That'll do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, so I think that that works. And then, so once someone's engaged with you on LinkedIn in a direct message, do you automatically add them to your list or you're asking for permission to add to your list? Well, a little bit of both kind of depends on the person if they're, because I also connect with a lot of candidates and so they usually want, they're hungry and they'll like, they're thrilled that I connected with them. So I'll add them. Yes. And then, you know, sometimes I'll try to like send them a message directly first through my email before I put them into Pardot. You know? Yeah. Again, I, you don't want to just send ice cold people in there. Correct. And, and, and it's, once again, it's up to, you know, who, who you're working with, et cetera. But the terms and conditions of LinkedIn do say that once you put your um, email address on LinkedIn, 
the terms and conditions of LinkedIn is that can be used for marketing purposes. Oh, uh, okay. So, I didn't realize yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. So once again, it depends on your audience. And, and I personally like to ask people rather mm-hmm. than just directly do it, but you can do it. So that's the uh, LinkedIn component of it. Uh, nice. Like you said, you, you use Upwork and Upwork to then, as I understand it, to upsell into a client base. So you're taking people off Upwork as a direct client. Is is that the strategy you're using with Upwork? Um, no, typically if I find them on Upwork, we'll stay on Upwork for the most part of time. And, and okay. they, Upwork has an incentive actually to do that. They are changing it now. Like the, the commission that they take goes down dramatically after a certain length of time. Okay. So, um, and I, I just look at it, it's, it's a cost to sale. Yes. And my close ratio is so interesting. So I still would say LinkedIn is my top lead gen tool, even though I, if we look at volumes of clients, I have a lot more on Upwork, but my bigger clients, my high quality, my retainer clients, they came from LinkedIn and they were usually from people that I had some interaction with in the past. So it's not cold people. So again, it's really important to build that relationship and then Upwork volumes, volumes, but people a 15 hour project and depends, you know, it depends on my mood. (laughs) You know, if I'm kind of slow and I see some of my people aren't super busy, then I'm like, Oh, I'll just take that 15 hour project because you know, why not? And then it could turn into a longer term project. Yeah. 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 And I I think it's, it's, it's really smart. Like two key things here that listen to Carol. So one is that, you know, if you're, if you're certainly just starting out on, you know, as a Salesforce partner or for that matter, any partner, and there is work on, on Upwork, use that to, to generate the cash flow to build the business that is going to be larger clients, which is then using LinkedIn. So I think those strategies together work really well. If you're, you're starting it, if you're, you know, got to find leads off your partner, I recommend that you also use LinkedIn to complement those because as we know, which is happening right at this moment, that when Salesforce makes a huge change to their account executive team, all those relationships you've built can go by the wayside. So, you know, I think it's, it's really good to have a combination of those and, and YouTube, is it something that you're putting a lot of time and effort in Carol, or is it sort of something? Not not tons. No, but it's so interesting. I always preach, you know, just baby steps, do a little bit at a time, especially when it comes to marketing, because I have a whopping 142 subscribers to my, you know, (laughs) hopefully more when you come check out at this listeners. And that like the first hundred took forever. And I did learn this one little secret. When you share your link, you actually share the link that has subscribe confirmation. So if they click on it, it's going to say, are you sure you want to subscribe? And that has definitely upped my subscriptions significantly. But the views that I have, I'm kind of blown away. And again, I'm, I don't think I can ever monetize because the requirements are nowhere what I'm going to achieve in a year. It's like 4,000 hours in a year. And I'm at like 500 hours in a year. And, and, and even if I did get to that point, I think it's pretty minuscule how much money you actually get. So YouTube, how I use it is it helps. It actually provides tons of value. So this could be for other consultants. It is not very fun to train people like, okay, go to the navigation. Oh, no, next one over. Okay, now do pull down. It's, you know, you got to be very patient. And it's really not the best use of my time or my consultant's time. So what do we do is watch the video, Mr. Client, and then... We're going to work in your system and you're going to, you know, either the video is going to teach you exactly how to do it. And now we don't need to have a training session on it. So it's like they get free training. So it's it's a huge value add. And so then I don't feel, you know, I'm probably under charging for compared to some other people tell me. But what I'm trying to go for, I'm trying to go for those retainer clients. I want them to keep coming back every month and sign up for four months, six months for a year. I've got several clients, like one client I've been with for 10 years, but that's, you know, we were calling for them many years ago. And then, you know, a couple other clients, three years, two years. And so we're not a one and done project agency. We want that retainer business. And, you know, how we do that is you don't charge $200 an hour. People can't do that forever. But while you're solving a problem, it's great. And then some clients I've actually, I have two training programs. One I have on a site called Podia, I put together, I just curated, you know, here's all the Pardot, 
you know, training that you need. But I found the shortest video, the the most succinct trailhead. And then I have some, you know, Word documents. So it's a self-service program. But what we find, a lot of people don't want to be self-service. <laughs> so, but what I do, so if anyone hires me for at least a 30-hour project, I give them free access to that that training program, which retails for $249. And then I just am finishing up a Udemy Pardot training program, much more professional. It's me talking live. We're walking through several, like 13 different, 11 sections. And that one, well, I'm not sure how much that's going to be. I'm working with Udemy. I'm probably going to let them fix the price because they they know what's going to give the most demand. Yes. And that is awesome. Like that took me a long, long time to put together and get the screenshots and I have handouts and it's a really nice part of training program. And I'm hoping it's going to produce some passive income. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 That, that, that's yeah, great. That and I think the big call out here is if you've got videos that you've given to your clients, right? Those ones can sit on YouTube. So they can do two things. A, you know, your clients can go and see that and they can also see other content but also your prospects can also benefit from that as well. So you're actually you know, serving two purposes rather than just having it buried in your own Google Drive or, you know, Doc. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, it's, Dropbox, and there's, I it's love here. doing them. I And most of them are just one hit. I don't edit them. I just record and post them up there. And so some of them are kind of goofy, whatever. But I think people like it. I and mean, one of my top one is 5,000 views and I've only yeah. done this for two years. So for me, that's, huge and like wow five thousand you know for some youtubers that's not in a dent but for what you know how niche this is i think it's yes. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it that's nice yeah brilliant well just a reminder we're talking to carol springer and uh it's episode 483 we're gonna have all the links etc in the show notes and we've really you know talked about a how you potentially as a salesforce partner could be extending your customer experience by having Pardot. And if you are, you know, Carol, I think is a great person to do that. And then if you're currently running a Salesforce business and you're looking to uh, increase your leads, you know, Carol's giving you some great uh, options there around LinkedIn, around Upwork, um, and particularly around LinkedIn is uh, going to see who's recruiting and then maybe following off the back of recruiting, which is a great little tip. I heard that in a podcast the other day and I thought, yeah, I've got to recommend that. So Carol, well done for doing that first. So what we're going to do now is go into the rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you four questions, Carol, and get your rapid fire responses. Are you ready for that? Yes. All right, let's do this. So the first one is what are some daily habits that help you scale Gabrielle sales? Well, I would say not quite daily is, um, you know, checking the Upwork jobs out there because they don't have part of new jobs all the time. So that for sure. Uh, social, I am, I love Instagram and that's probably my, if that is my daily one. So I'm continuing to build my audience and they're not all Salesforce clients specifically, but I engage with them. I follow more people all the time and I'm building up um, I have a Gabriel Sales Instagram page and have a Gabriel Sales Twitter also. So just constantly following new people. So they follow you back. And then, you know, it, again, it's just building that audience. It's out building. And then I'm, I'm really big into networking on Slack groups as well. I found that that was a big goal last year. I said, I, I don't, there's too much. Like, what do I do? You know, so I've, I picked three Slack groups. And those are the only ones I engage with. One's very Pardot focused, one's Salesforce content creator focused, and then another one is just for the local university here. Mike gives you to add a fourth there, which is the Cloud Consultants Collective, but we'll talk about that oh, uh, yes. l- later. Okay. But uh, the next question is around uh, where do you find um, more information about scaling your business? Where do you go to research? You know, where, where are you learning from? What I've observed over time, and I've been, tell this um, when people that needed our sales help to B2B sales follows, I believe, B2C trends. And so it used to be like, if you're going to buy a refrigerator or a new bicycle, you are not just going to walk into any store and just buy it. You're going to look online, you know, consumer reports has been around forever, but you're just going to look at the reviews and see, you know, what makes the most sense. And that's happening with B2B. And so with my travel podcast where next travel with Kristen and carol (laughs) is 
I do a lot of Instagram. I'm seeing what's working, what's not working, what's engaging. And so watching the B2C trends is what I see. And then I talk to a lot of other podcasters and what are you doing? What's working? What's not working? So I, and I, and I see that crossing over to B2B. And then also I get um, information from books, but not the typical sales books. It's really about, I think emotional intelligence is yes. and being balanced as a human being because yes. people want to work with people they like. The Four yes. Agreements book, um, Stephen Covey, Earl yes. Nightingale, Lead the Field. You know, just it teaches you. That's probably the most salesy book. And then every once in a while, I'll pick up another book. And my husband reads like crazy. So if there's something good, he's like blank or you know whatever the the latest book is, he'll he'll share it with he'll me. Grab it. Awesome. And podcasts. I mean, I find that I'm not finding enough podcasts that are independent like this. So I'm just was so excited that we connected. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, the next question is one wish. What's one wish we could grant for Gabrielle Sales? Um, if you could tell me where social media is going, <laughs> like, should I invest more time and effort into YouTube or, you know, is TikTok, I've never touched TikTok. Is that going away? I love to dance, but I, I don't think I would do it for my business right now. <laughs> but yeah, if you could give that to me, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I'd love that as well. And the last one is, uh, you know, what do you know now about running great Gabrielle sales and certainly running around the part of, part of the business that you wish you had uh, known earlier? I think creating more content because yeah. that just takes a long time for it to develop. So I wish I would have started sooner because if I started, like I, I was training clients in 2012 on Pardot. Like, why did I not load that? You know, yeah. maybe I would be at that that rate right now that I mentioned and just, you just kind of keep doing, you know, and then you got to find what your niche is. Like, you know, not everyone wants to do videos. I love podcasting. I want to find more podcast speaking engagements. Um, I do run in one for fun, as I said, and I don't really have the bandwidth to create a whole nother podcast. So yeah. I know, yeah. you know, it's, it's a decent amount of work. So yeah, yeah. And, and, you uh, gotta, you, you gotta love it. Right. I, I love yeah. the talking, but I don't like all the editing and all that other stuff. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And look, either do I, that's why I've got a great team supporting me that, 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 that do it. <laughs> nice. So a big shout out to them. But, but I think, you know, you're right. It's, um, I think today, you know, one of the key lessons is you've got content. Right, you've already got content, you're just not publishing it, right? So it doesn't have to be perfect. And just remember that you've only got to be better than the person themselves that's trying to implement something, right? So Right. You know, yeah, you, and it's didn't you don't have to and, be perfect. Right. And I know to the listeners, right. And people are buying from you and so you gotta get let let them get to know you. Yes. But one caution I have is sometimes I get a little too silly and goofy with new clients. Maybe they live somewhere I've always wanted to live or I start cracking jokes and I swear 50% of the time I don't win those deals. So just when you first meet someone, I always put on the professional hat. Yeah. hundred yep. percent. Yeah. True. Yes. True. True. Which and you know it's a balance, right? It's a balance between being yourself and, and, and not crossing a line that makes people yes. feel uncomfortable and reading what style of person as well. So, you know, I think there's some good software out there now that you can actually, I can look at someone's LinkedIn profile and work out what, personality profile they are and then matching really that. yeah that's um humanity uh ai which uh, we'll put in the show notes is um is a really good little software for that but uh look i know that we've uh we've gone a little longer uh but that's because you've created so much value but thanks for coming on today carol and uh, we wish you uh, every success and there'll be more from me uh, after we say goodbye to carol Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. That was a great interview by Carol. There was lots of value in there. If you're a Salesforce partner, I think Pardot might be a really good um, opportunity for you. So hit Carol up for that. But also if you're just starting out, you know, there's some great tips around using Upwork and using LinkedIn and job ads, et cetera, to generate more income for your own business. Uh, so why don't you share what you loved on LinkedIn? Give uh, Carol a reach out. And also if you've got peers that you know would benefit from this, please share it with them. Check out our solo shows. And also if you're scaling your cloud consulting business and want a great benchmarking tool, go to our ebook it's completely free you can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash blueprint to get your copy today your free copy and please take action to grow with less effort and more reward 
Learning is just one piece of the puzzle. It is now time for action. Head to today's show page at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. Get the links and put it into action. Head to your favorite podcast platform, subscribe, rate, and review the show. Suggest topics for me to cover at paul at paulhigginsmentoring.com. And don't wait one more minute to gain access to content, especially for you, a cloud consultant, at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash newsletter. This could be the difference between wasting time figuring it out yourself or scaling quickly with less effort to enjoy life.